So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar ABCs of BAC Toxicology for Prosecutors and Investigators. My name is Emily Thrush, and I'm the Senior Project Coordinator at Equitas. And today's webinar is made possible through funding from the U.S. Department of Justice, the Office of Violence Against Women. This presentation will explain the toxicology of alcohol as well as drugs in lay terms that will help participants understand how they affect the body and it will explore common issues and challenges related to the investigation and prosecution of sexual assault cases where alcohol is present. Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. And our staff is comprised of former prosecutors with over 100 years of collective experience and they conduct legal research, provide 24-7 case consultation, and serve as mentors and instructors around the country. As Patricia said, please feel free to use this, the chat box in our platform throughout the webinar to ask any questions that you might have. And if we can't get to them in the webinar, we will circle back and, and respond to them afterwards. Today we have two presenters. Uh, John Wilkinson, my colleague here at Equitas, is an attorney advisor who consults, trains, and provides resources uh, for prosecutors and allied professionals handling cases involving violence against women. And John's extensive experience is in his full biography, which is available for download in the box that Patricia mentioned uh, in terms of our materials. Our other presenter is Jennifer Summers, and she is the Deputy Chief of Special Investigations and Prosecutions Unit at the New York State Attorney General's Office, and her biography is also available. There are one PDF uh, with both biographies there. You'll also notice that the slides from today's presentation is there, so you can follow along. And we are recording this so that we can send, you can send it to colleagues or refer back to it later. So I would now like to turn the floor over to John for the substantive portion of today's webinar. Thanks, Emily. Um, and thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in. Um, so uh, I was a former assistant commonwealth attorney in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where uh, I handled some of these cases that involved alcohol. And um, it's great that we have Jen Summers here, who is not only a, a prosecutor, but also an actual toxicologist. And so she makes what can be scary for prosecutors very understandable. And it, it makes these cases uh, a lot um, more understandable and it helps us identify challenges and strategies, ways to overcome those challenges. The more we understand about uh, toxicology, the better off we are in these cases. So those are some of the objectives we'll have today. We're gonna be better able to analyze cases with a better understanding of toxicology and it, it isn't gonna be uh, overly compl complex. Um, Jen's gonna break it down for us, so that's gonna be very helpful. We'll also be better able to consider the disparate effects of alcohol based on a number of factors, including gender. So that's uh, one of the surprising things that Jen explains is how gender uh, and alcohol work, um, but a lot of other factors uh, that impact how drunk, how quickly you get intoxicated or how quickly uh, victims may become intoxicated. Um, the other thing uh, that we'll be better able to do is overcome challenges related to the prosecution of sexual assault where alcohol and drugs are present. When we have this better understanding, these cases don't, uh, frighten us as much or, or present as big a challenge and we're able to figure out ways to go forward where we may not have been able to before because we didn't understand all of these factors. And so in addition to just the toxicology that Jen's going to talk about today, Equitas has a lot of additional resources on how to uh, go at these cases, strategies um, to investigate and prosecute these cases. So uh, we'll talk about mostly toxicology today, but some of those strategies as well. Um, if we can get folks to just uh, identify in this poll question uh, what discipline uh, they come from, that would be very helpful. Um, so if you guys can go ahead and uh, uh, chime in there. I don't think I have to wait for that to fill in. So just go ahead as you can, chime in, and uh, we'll move forward. Except I can't see the slide. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, I think the next slide says, oh, how do you, why do we need to understand toxicology? Okay, so there's lots of reasons we want to understand uh, these things, um, and uh, they're listed here. It's going to help us make charging decisions, so we're going to be better able to understand these crimes when we understand toxicology. Also, analyzing victim credibility. I think there is a general 
idea that when a victim got uh, voluntarily intoxicated, that uh, one, either the jury's not going to believe them, or two, even worse, that we simply don't believe our victims just because they got voluntarily intoxicated. And that's uh, incorrect. We need to believe these victims. They're coming forward uh, for a reason. They deserve to be believed, and their cases deserve to be thoroughly investigated. So we don't make those credibility judgments just based on that one factor, and, and understanding toxicology helps us uh, understand that. It'll help us better educate judges and juries, which is a key strategy in these cases that we're going to have to address. We'll understand how offenders use alcohol better. Uh, it, you know, that voluntarily intoxicated victim uh, may be exactly why this offender chose to assault her. Uh, that is uh, something that we need to understand and focus on. It'll help us collect additional evidence, do better interviews, ask questions about uh, intoxication, how much someone had to eat, um, what in effect it had on them. Um, it'll help us provide better services for those victims. Uh, we can recognize uh, the trauma that's associated uh, with this assault, even when a victim is intoxicated. We can't uh, sort of assume that that was less traumatic for some reason. And it'll help us uh, respond to and address and anticipate certain defenses, particularly that blackout uh, defense that defense attorneys might uh, try and use that, um, oh, the victim uh, was intoxicated, she blacked out, she just doesn't remember that specific point where she consented to sexual intercourse. So uh, we want to focus on those, and that understanding of toxicology will help us do that. So the alcohol and drugs can affect any of these cases. We saw it a lot in our sexual assault cases, but there's victims who uh, are involved with drugs and alcohol in domestic violence cases. Um, sometimes as a coping mechanism, and in human trafficking cases as well, um, as a coping mechanism, but also as a method of uh, power and control over those victims of human trafficking. If they keep them uh, abusing drugs and alcohol, it's easier to maintain that control over them. So understanding this can uh, help us with all of these different crimes. Uh, how common is uh, alcohol-facilitated sexual assault? Well, by this one study, they no uh, noted that almost half of reported sexual assaults amongst young adults take place while the victim is under the influence of alcohol. Uh, so that's quite a, a large number, and I know uh, all of you are seeing these cases out there where alcohol is involved. Some of us do a, a great job on these. Some of us can do a better job on these, and understanding toxicology will help us. It's not just that victims of alcohol, but perpetrators use alcohol as well. And these uh, studies demonstrated that uh, approximately 50% of all sexual assaults are committed by a man who has been drinking. It doesn't mean he's uh, drunk or completely intoxicated, but he's using alcohol to enable him to commit these crimes. Uh, and in a nationwide survey of college students, 68% of sexual assaults involve alcohol consumption by the offender. So it's something that uh, perpetrators use, too, um, as they're trying to commit this crime. So we see alcohol involved in these crimes uh, from both sides. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jen Summers to talk about toxicology. Uh, so okay. on to you, Jen. All right, thank you. So I just want to start with a little disclaimer. John and everyone, they always say we have a real toxicologist. I'm not a practicing toxicologist, um, so I just want, I want to give that little disclaimer. Um, I, I did uh, obtain a master's degree in toxicology before I went to law school. So I, I do have a science background. I love science. And I, I really think that understanding this stuff um, is so significant because it, it kind of helps you to properly contextualize these cases. And I hope will make you a little bit more willing to take on these cases. These are super challenging cases, but they deserve to be taken seriously. So just in broad strokes, when we talk about toxicology, um, usually it means to a prosecutor or an officer waiting to get the results of the chemical test back from the lab. What it means broadly is the study of um, the adverse effects of foreign chemicals on liby, living organisms, which is basically all these things are poison when it comes to our body, whether we're talking about alcohol, marijuana, pesticides, you name it. And the human body has like different ways of handling different substances um, and trying to get rid of them. But then toxicology is also concerned with how do they affect us while they are in our bodies, before our bodies are able 
to get rid of them. And when it comes to alcohol and, and, and the um, trouble it, it, it brings, um, I love the saying, if recreational drugs were tools, alcohol would be a sledgehammer. And I think that's so true. And just, again, to kind of contextualize everything I'm going to say and talk about, I am a drinker. I've been intoxicated many times. I know what I'm talking about in a lot of this. Um, and frankly, I think it's helpful in these types of cases to have jurors who can identify with some of the things that you'll be arguing to them in your closing argument. Um, all right, so let's just, we're going to do a little bit of an overview of where we're going here. I'm going to talk about the absorption and distribution and excretion of alcohol, which is broadly uh, referred to as metabolism. So we're just going to talk about how metabolism gets into your blood and, and then how it exits your body. Then we're going to talk about um, physiology. What exactly is it that alcohol is doing that makes people drunk? And then we're going to speak briefly about um, some of the more common uh, substances used to facilitate date rapes that are not alcohol. Alcohol is the most common, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about drugs that are also used to facilitate sex assault. But we're going to start with absorption. So if, if we were seeing each other in person, I would, be, I would hold a, a can of something, a beer, and I would say, you know, absorption is getting the alcohol from this drink into my brain, into my blood, because it needs to get into my blood before it can start affecting my brain. So absorption is the passage of alcohol into the bloodstream. And we're talking about alcohol in the conventional sense. We're talking about ethanol. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about beer or wine or liquor. The ethanol that's contained in all of those things that makes people drunk. Um, so the beer has a more dilute uh, ethanol content than wine. Wine has a more dilute ethanol concentration than liquor, but it's still ethanol. So some people are kind of under a little bit of a misguided um, impression that, you know, tequila has some magical type of alcohol in it and, you know, something else is something different. They're all the same. It's all ethanol. And if we all drank what kind of um, <laughs> the way that we did 20 or 30 years ago before everything was sort of supersized, um, then one standard uh, beer would have the same amount of ethanol in it as one standard pour of wine and one standard shot, right? And they would all have approximately the same amount of ethanol. Now things have changed and it's like nobody ever drinks those kind of amounts anymore. Um, but sort of just to visualize, I mean, one shot is equal to one beer is equal to one glass of wine in standard measure. And I already talked about alcohol is alcohol. So where is it absorbed, right? So remember I said it's got to get from the can into my bloodstream. And just to bring back a very, very little amount of your high school biology class, um, Alcohol is absorbed on any surface where there's like blood vessels. <laughs> so um, you take a drink and you, uh, a very small amount is actually absorbed directly into your blood from your mouth. Um, but you don't kind of walk around with your, your drink in your mouth all night, you swallow it. Um, but it's that principle that allows people who are having like cravings for cigarettes to hold that Nicorette gum between their tongue and their cheek and some of, the, um, some of the substance will diffuse directly into the bloodstream, and that's why I kind of, they, they encourage you to do that when you're having one of those cravings, um, because things can um, absorb directly from the mouth. But in the case of alcohol, the first place where it goes and sits for a while um, is the stomach, and your stomach is vascular. I mean, there's, there, there are blood vessels um, all throughout your stomach, um, so some of the alcohol that you drink is going to be absorbed into your stum in through your stomach. Um, but your small intestine is like the real deal. The small intestine, um, the stomach was made to like grind things up and mash it up. Um, not to be, I'm 
not trying to be graphic or make anyone sick, but that's the reason that we have a stomach, um, is to make things acceptable to get into the small intestine where they can then be absorbed. Your small intestine has a huge surface area. There's like conflicting literature. It sort of depends on the size of the person. But the surface area of your small intestine is somewhere between the um, surface area of a badminton court and a tennis court. So regardless, that's, that's a lot of space over which um, stuff can be absorbed into the bloodstream. So kind of once it hits the small intestine, once that alcohol hits the small intestine, um, it's going to get right into your blood and start circulating around where it can affect your brain. Um, so the average time it takes for all of the alcohol contained in, you know, one drink, we're just talking one drink at this time, to be completely absorbed into the blood. So it's no longer, you know, in the stomach. Um, it's, it's, all, it's no longer in the small intestine where it wouldn't hang out for long anyway. Um, the average time for that to happen is anywhere from 15 minutes. It could take all the way up to one and a half hours. Now, that's a huge amount of variation, but there's pretty much one thing that determines where on the spectrum the alcohol is, um, where on the spectrum that, that absorption rate is going to be. Um, and that is whether or not the person who is drinking the alcohol is doing so on an empty stomach. So, so I showed you that um, picture. The stomach is like above the small intestine, and it gets stuff ready to go into the small intestine. Um, and if, there's, if um, the stomach is empty, there's nothing preventing these alcoholic drinks from like floating right through. And the people that are on this call who have consumed an alcoholic beverage, um, I, I can actually ask you to raise your hand since no one will be embarrassed, but um, if you've consumed an al alcoholic beverage on an empty stomach, you all know exactly what I'm talking about. Like it feels different. You can sort of feel those effects much quicker than if you are consuming alcohol on a full stomach. Um, so just in terms of reasons why, I mean, yes, the food acts as a physical barrier, but more importantly, there's a valve um, at the bottom of the stomach, and it opens and closes depending on whether or not there's food in the stomach and whether or not that food has been properly, you know, mashed up enough to allow it to be dumped into the small intestine. And so if there's no food there, there's no reason for the valve to be closed, and the alcohol goes straight through. So you see with people who are drinking alcohol on an empty stomach, their blood alcohol content spikes way up. Right, It goes right straight up because that food, the um, alcohol is being immediately absorbed into the blood. Whereas people who consume alcohol on a full stomach, it takes longer to, um, to reach the blood. And during the time that the um, alcohol is in the blood, it's constantly being metabolized and removed from the blood. So the people who consume alcohol on a full stomach, they never see those spiky blood. I'm not saying they never do. You can obviously drink enough alcohol that it's going to make up for it. Um, but you're never going to see the blood alcohol content you would see if you consumed that alcohol on an empty stomach. Now, just really quickly um, to draw the distinction here, you know, food in your stomach doesn't have an effect on, you know, things that you inject into your, into your veins, like heroin, um, because there it's being injected directly into your blood. It doesn't, food in your stomach doesn't affect how quickly you get high if you smoke things. Um, it doesn't affect uh, how quickly you get intoxicated if you snort things. But whether you're talking about date rape drugs um, or mushrooms or alcohol or anything else that is consumed in the way that nature intended, which is to eat them, <laughs> to have them go through your digestive system, 
having food in your stomach is a protective mechanism. Now, we don't have time in this, um, in this webinar, but there are um, some very creative ways that people are now using to um, get or attempt to get intoxicated by alcohol without drinking the alcohol. Um, and we just don't have time to get into that. Um, but so we're just going to stick with um, the main primary way that people continue to get intoxicated, and that's drinking alcohol. So there are some other factors that, that, that um, can have an effect on how quickly someone's blood alcohol content rises. Um, and I've, I've put them down there. You know, sort of the classic case of a carbonated beverage is, you know, light champagne. You know, the, the bubbles kind of facilitate, the, carbon, the carbonation sort of facilitates um, the absorption. But really, these other factors are very, very minimal compared to whether or not the person who's drinking alcohol is doing so on an empty stomach. All right, so, so we, we had our drink, whatever it was. We started drinking it. Now it's in our blood. It's starting to flow around in our bloodstream. Where does it go? And more importantly, why do you care about where it goes? And the answer to that is there's, there's a really important gender issue within this whole thing um, that I'd just like to, you to be aware of kind of as you analyze these cases going forward. So alcohol, again, as most people are aware, mixes very well with water. And that's why you can um, prepare like a scotch and soda water or a gin and tonic water um, because alcohol mixes well with water. Now, if you took alcohol and tried to mix it with like oil, um, it, you, would, you would see that classic separation. It, not as much as you see it with water, but um, it, it doesn't mix as well with fat. Um, or oil. Um, so alcohol is going to tend to accumulate in, in our bodies in tissues that have a high water content um, and not as much in tissues that have a high fat content. Um, so it, um, alcohol doesn't accumulate in our fat and in our bones but it does accumulate in those tissues that are primarily, that are really watery, which is the liver, the muscle, and the brain. So just to, to, to kind of draw another distinction, I think it's sometimes so helpful to kind of understand broadly here. There are some substances that do accumulate in fat, and um, the one that comes to mind most easily is marijuana. Um, and that's why, you know, you can take a marijuana test a week after, not, not you personally, but if people take a marijuana um, drug test, like, you know, days after having consumed marijuana, it might come back positive. And the reason for that is that when things accumulate in fat, um, it's, it's more difficult for the human body to get rid of it. We like things to be watery so that we can excrete them. Um, when things are in our fat, you, they have to be changed and modified a lot before they can be um, excreted um, in the urine or in other ways. It's just much easier for the human body to get rid of things that are water-soluble. Um, and alcohol doesn't accumulate in our bones, but other things like lead do. Um, alcohol accumulates in the liver and the muscle and the brain. Now, here's maybe one of the important takeaways that I'd like to um, have you get from this. And so please excuse this is my handmade slide because I really was hoping that everybody can kind of understand this. So I'd like you to focus on the left-hand side uh, of the screen for a moment. Take, take a vessel that's running through a, um, a place where there's a lot of fat. Um, so, that, so that blood vessel has that alcohol in it. Now, I just told you that alcohol doesn't really mix well with fat. So when you have a vessel that's running through uh, an area that's got a lot of fat in it, um, the alcohol is going to stay in the blood vessel. It's not going to want to leave the vessel and sort of diffuse into the fat and hang out there for a while. Um, 
contrast that with what happens when that same vessel is flowing through an area where instead of being surrounded by a lot of fat, it's surrounded by a lot of muscle. My muscle is extremely watery, as I just mentioned, and when you have a vessel that's going through that the muscle, the alcohol does tend to diffuse across the blood vessel wall and kind of hang out temporarily displaced in that muscle. So that means that the concentration in the blood decreases, whereas if the alcohol is flowing through something that's surrounded by fat, it's going to stay there. And um, what the kind of practical implication for that is, when you're dealing with people with a higher fat content, they're going to have, drink per drink, a higher blood alcohol content than someone with a higher muscle content. And I just, um, so, so that means like for women and men in general, there is a big difference um, because of um, just the way that hormones affect um, the way that men and women um, kind of carry themselves from a physiological standpoint. The average man is 68% water. I know you, the men on the call, I, I don't know if that pleases you or displeases you, but um, so the average man is a, almost 70% water um, because, again, the average man is has a higher proportion of muscle compared with the average woman. Um, and I'm, again, I'm just speaking in averages here. There are definitely anomalies. There are definitely very muscular women. There are definitely very, very unmuscular men. I'm speaking in averages now. The average woman um, has a higher proportion of fat <laughs> than the average man. And that means that the average woman is only 55% watery. So the average woman has less muscle and more fat. And the practical implication for that is that for a given amount of alcohol, a woman, even if she is the exact same weight as a man, is going to have a higher blood alcohol content. It also means, that, so just maybe stop reading for a second, because I just want to say one thing broadly here. It also means that when you're, when you're kind of looking at those charts that say, if you weigh this much, this is how much your blood alcohol content would be. It's not that simple, because those charts don't take into consideration whether you're 6'2 or 5'2 and weigh 200 pounds. Um, and, you know, whether you have, you know, you know, what your BMI is and all that, that all matters. When, when we look at larger people, people who have a lot of fatty tissue, I think there's a tendency to say they're never, you know, that it would take a lot for the, that person to get drunk because they're so heavy. And that's simply not true. For the most part, having that extra weight does nothing to shield someone from the effects of alcohol. Um, so maybe kind of just keep that in mind um, when you're sort of looking at these cases in the future. But I just want to talk about that example of what this means. It means that, now again, I'm talking about averages here. If a one, an average 140-pound male, so, so in order for the, for the male to be average, so he's not underweight or overweight, and him to weigh 140 pounds, he would probably be on the shorter side of the average male, right? But so, so he's average. He's not over or underweight. He sits down and consumes alcohol with an average 140-pound female, right? So she's neither overweight she's, nor underweight. They're, you know, both of these people are average. Um, and they consume the same amount of alcohol over the same period of time. Just by virtue of the average amount of fat that that woman will have, whether she, you know, and, and we're assuming here that she's neither over nor underweight, same with the, the guy, um, just by virtue of the amount of fat she will have on average, she is going to have a higher blood alcohol content than the male is. 
Now, I don't know, you know, the, the, that's not really probably the typical case scenario, so let's put in like kind of a biologically relevant example um, or a more biologically relevant example um, because, you know, these can happen with every permutation possible, but let's say that a 190-pound male and a 125-pound female, again, just assuming neither one of them is under or overweight, um, they consume the exact same amount of beer over the course of two hours. The female will potentially have a blood alcohol content double what the male has. So that's kind of a huge disadvantage to women. Um, and, and I say this, you know, when I think the college culture is, is so, it's, it's dangerous for women because um, I, I, I'm not suggesting that they should do anything different. I'm just saying it's, it ends up being a, a feeding ground in many instances for people that are inclined to rape people because you're dealing with people that are kind of maybe shy about their weight and aren't eating what they should, so they're, you know, binging on empty stomach and trying to keep up with people um, and, and kind of numbers like this. And I'm going to talk about the way that, that when maybe society treats um, these two a little bit differently, but hoping that going forward um, when, when these come across your desk, you might look at them a little bit differently. Um, so but let's talk real quick about how do we get rid of the alcohol. So it's, it's, it's going around in my, my bloodstream. It's, you know, affecting my brain. <laughs> um, so how does, my, how does my body get rid of it? I mean, obviously, if we didn't get rid of it, we'd be drunk forever. So um, we get rid of it mainly, and I'm only going to speak about this part because it's, it's so primary. Um, we get rid of it by metabolizing it. So about 95% of the alcohol is metabolized in our livers by an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, if you have food in your stomach, that does, there is a little, there is some alcohol dehydrogenase in the stomach. So there is some of that enzyme in the stomach. But the reason that we have a stomach is not to, like, metabolize things. That's why we have livers. <laughs> so, so most of that alcohol dehydrogenase is in the liver. Um, so here's the pathway. I only say this because some people are lacking one of these enzymes, and you might know someone, so now you'll know exactly what's going on here. So you have ethanol. It's um, turned into this kind of nasty thing on top called acetaldehyde in the liver. Um, and then another enzyme called acetaldehyde dehydrogenase turns the acetaldehyde into vinegar, and the vinegar breaks down into carbon dioxide that we exhale and water that we excrete during one of those many trips to the restroom. Um, but um, many people of Asian descent lack that enzyme in the middle, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, and so when they consume alcohol, the acetaldehyde builds up and it has nowhere to go. So they turn red and feel very sick. And this is actually the way that the drug antabuse works, um, is um, antabuse inhibits acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. So if you have someone who's taking antabuse um, in an attempt to stop drinking and they consume alcohol, um, then they feel the same things that those people who um, are sometimes of Asian descent and cannot process alcohol, um, they feel those same effects. So there is yet another, um, well, let me just say the rate of metabolism, so the rate at which your body is able to get rid of this, it doesn't change. It's not like if you drink a lot, your body kicks into high gear and produces a lot of that enzyme and you can get rid of it. Um, it's fixed and unchanged. Um, and on average, uh, and I hate to say this because, you know, some people just biologically express more enzymes, some express less, um, your, your, your liver is going to basically um, take the alcohol in one beer or one glass of wine or one shot per hour out of your system. So every hour that you're drinking, if you only drank, on average, if you only drank one beer an hour, 
for three hours and you waited until the end of your third hour and tested your blood, it, would, it should be right around zero if you express the average amount of, this, um, of these enzymes. Um, and you're drinking only a standard amount, which as I mentioned earlier, Americans no longer do. Um, but this also gives you some context for when you're, I don't know if any of you are like, have dealt with DWI before and you get people who are, you know, blood alcohol content is up over 2.0. The fact that that's working against your body taking one drink out an hour is kind of a stunning amount to drink, but. Um, okay, so one other thing I wanna mention here that's is that startling events don't sober people up. The only thing that sobers people up is the passage of time in your liver. And I say that because, like, you know, I, I had a case once where um, it was a male-on-male -male sex assault where the victim was passed out cold, woke up, and another male was sexually assaulting him. Um, and, you know, it went to trial, and it was a, originally it was a hung jury, and there were two uh, men on the jury. And, I, I mean, I, this was a rural jurisdiction. It was years ago. But anyway, they were, they were kind of like, I would have sobered up immediately and beat the crap out of that person. And I thought if it was a retrial, I was actually going to call a toxicologist to say that's just not the way. Biologically, you might think that you do all sorts of things, and we do, you know, this taking the neurobiology of trauma out of it. You know, the simple fact of the matter is coffee will result in, in a drunk person being a little bit more awake. A cold shower, yes, you might wake the drunk person up, but they are still going to be drunk. So um, it's the passage of time in your liver that sobers people up, not startling events. So there's another gender factor here. Men have more um, of the enzyme that um, breaks down alcohol in um, their stomachs than male, males do. Now I just said, like, look, most of this happens in your liver, but some of it does occur in your stomach. So um, it's, it's significant that um, young females cannot process alcohol at the same rate as young males. So in addition to kind of having, um, being disproportionately affected by alcohol, whether we like it or not, these are biological facts. And I, I don't think that, you know, I've heard some people suggest that, you know, we shouldn't kind of be discussing this because it's sort of, you know, almost like victim blaming. And I just, I don't see that at all. I'm, I'm blaming, <laughs> the people that <laughs> that prey on <laughs> other people. Um, but I, I do think we have to we have to kind of acknowledge these realities. Women are affected by alcohol more than men are, and they're less able to process that alcohol than men are. And yet, what do we do when we get cases or when we hear people talk about cases where the victim was drinking? What tends to be kind of the societal response is, she deserved it, you know, what did she think was gonna happen? Like, it's her fault, right? Even though, like, you know, the alcohol would have affected her much more than it would have affected her, what tends to happen is blame, right? And what happens with a man who I've just told you is, is not affected to the same extent in the same manner that the woman is affected? What tends to happen is, we excuse, right? Well, we can't hold this guy responsible. He was just some poor, dumb, drunk guy who made an, a, a bad decision, right? And they just think, like, if we can start to minimally, like, chip away at that. I mean, it's just so wrong on so many levels, but especially when you kind of, um, um, when you kind of uh, look at it in, um, in, in this context. So somebody, the inverse is true in middle age. About what age does the change happen? So I don't know that there's ever been a double blind. I, I, I actually have looked into this. I don't think there's like, and I'm, I'm only going to answer this one question for now, and then we're going to hold them to the end. Um, I don't think there's ever been like a double blind study on that, but they've drawn sort of some loose conclusions. Um, so I, I can't tell you exactly what the average age is when this starts to, um, when this starts to change. 
Um, I saw somebody else answer, answer, ask the question. Can I, can I come back to these at the end? Because we have uh, so much that I want to get to. Um, sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, I, I, I promise we have time or else the people can contact me directly. It's fine. Um, okay, so I want to talk really quickly about the mechanism of intoxication. So why does alcohol make us drunk? Um, alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. So as you probably know, um, depressants slow down the central nervous system. And, you know, for those of you that have, like, seen people who are under the influence of barbiturates, nitrous oxide tranquilizers, and the classic date rape drugs, um, it's just a different looking type of intoxication than with stimulants. Stimulants speed up the central nervous system, so you have cocaine and crack and amphetamine. When you're looking at under the influence of a stimulant, it just looks so different than um, what it looks like when um, that person is under the influence of a depressant. When we're talking about alcohol in particular, um, it affects the most highly developed or highly evolved, however you look at it, it affects that part of the brain first. So that happens to be called your prefrontal cortex. And it's, it's also the part of the brain that is kind of like the most, um, like, uh, um, not like, um, Vulnerable, I guess. It, it's just vulnerable to the effects of things first because it's the last part of our brain that was developed when you look through, like, compare us to lizards and stuff. We all have brains, but they don't have the prefrontal cortex that we have. Um, so it's a very vulnerable part of the brain, and it's affected first. Um, so at kind of the very first, um, the lower blood alcohol contents, um, they're going to affect the prefrontal cortex. And then it works its way back um, and affects last, like it, the, those regions E and F, which are like the vital functions, those things that just allow us to kind of like maintain a heartbeat, take breaths. Um, those are affected at higher concentrations of alcohol. So let's just kind of go through it. And I think, again, this is some of you are going to know, probably many of you are going <laughs> to appreciate a lot of what I'm talking about because you're going to have experienced this before. But um, so the first thing to go is stuff that's associated with what we call the euphoria stage. So if, if we're talking about a young novice drinker, somebody who is not um, kind of uh, been drinking for a while and, you know, has sort of built up a bit of a resistance, um, they might start to feel this euphoria stuff early on, like at a point oh six. For for somebody like me who's been drinking for many years, I don't. I mean, maybe maybe I'm closer to the other end, but maybe not. Um, but anyway, so here's what you start to see. And the first thing, which I want to just spend a little bit of time on, is the impaired judgment. This is because like your your prefrontal cortex when um, when you when you um, let's say you see your boss and he or she is wearing something that you absolutely find hideous and you are not consuming alcohol um, and they ask you, you know, do you like this or something, you might, um, so, so you might want to say the truth, but you might, your, your other, you know, your brain is telling you, you know, there are ramifications of this, you know, you might want to think through this, you know. Um, when you consume alcohol, you start to become very myopic, right, this is the same people same reason why some people will sing karaoke when they are drinking alcohol and some people will never sing karaoke no matter how much alcohol they drink and some people um, will <laughs> sing karaoke without consuming any alcohol. Like those people in the middle, the ones that will only do it when they're drinking, like they know they don't sound very good or they're a little shy and they don't want to feel like a jerk, but you start drinking the alcohol and you don't, you're myopic. You're just thinking that's fun, it's going to be great, I'm not, you know. This, I, I could go on and on about drunk texting and everything else, all right? But that is kind of the reason for that. Your brain is not feeding those, those sort of independent messages of like, hey, wait, you might want to think about this, right? 
hey, maybe, you know, I know you're tired and stuff, but don't go into this room because, you know, this person's going to rape you or those types of things. Um, those are the types of um, things I'm talking about. So anyway, at the euphoria stage, you kind of, your, your attention span, span shortens, and these are the types of things that you start to experience. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this here because this, this frustrates me more than anything. But please apply common sense to the issue of impaired judgment, right? Everybody always, not obviously not everybody, but the thing that is said most often about alcohol-facilitated sex assault is that it's buyer's remorse. You know, this person engaged in voluntary intercourse with someone and then regretted it because she, you know, didn't have good judgment. Now she's, like, making this up to sort of, like, you know, get out of it. Right? There's no hiding from the fact. It is a biological fact that people do do things while they're under the influence of alcohol that they later regret. However, why people don't go to step two, right? People generally distance themselves from things that simply embarrass them, right? So, so if I get drunk and I sing the karaoke, you know, if it's just mortifying to me, if I, if I was the joke of the bar room, I don't want to relive that. I just want to get over it. I certainly don't go back to the bar and sue the bar owner. That's just not the way that most people process things that happen when they were drunk, that they did, that they just simply regret. I would also say it just it, it is – it takes so much more resolve to come forward in a case and report a rape when you know ahead of time, look, I was drunk, you know, people are going to judge that. It's just, it's, you know, alcohol may make you do things that you're, you know, you're, you're sort of embarrassed by, but it doesn't transform you hours and days and weeks and sometimes years later to into a liar. It doesn't cause you to become like, non-conversant in the truth years later, okay, or weeks or months later. And it's just silly. I, I don't really understand why it is in this one area. And, and I think it's kind of an important thing to, 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 to try to draw on, you know, experience when you're giving closing arguments to your jury. Why in this one area can't people understand that, right? It is this very characteristic of alcohol that makes it an ideal weapon to rape someone with because that person knows that this person isn't going to be taken seriously. Um, so, so I'm just hoping that, that, you know, everybody can kind of, like, start to process that, that aspect, that unavoidable aspect of alcohol with sort of a more commonsensical um, lens. So, yeah, and I just think it's an important thing to remind a jury, you know, yes, an impaired, impaired judgment makes a person responsible for the natural consequences of her actions. If I drink and I vomit, <laughs> if I drink too much and I make a fool of myself, and I drink too much and I, you know, feel sick the entire next day, that's on me. Those are effects of alcohol that I own. I did it. I drank it. I own it. But the only way that I'm going to be raped if I drink too much alcohol, if somebody else commits an illegal act upon me. So I just, I think it's really important to, to kind of draw those um, points home for the jury. All right, so after the alcohol affects the pre, prefrontal cortex, it, it starts to move back in your head a little bit. And it's not like you all of a sudden get your judgment back and lose your balance, right? Things just get worse and worse as the night wears on. That's just the first thing that starts to erode. Um, but your body movements are going to become more uncoordinated. Your re reaction times are going to increase. Um, you might have trouble understanding or remembering things. Your speech may begin to slur, all those things. Sleepiness. Remember, this is a central nervous system depressant. And, and I always think about this when, you know, you, you get you, – I used to get cases like the, the woman would be sleeping or would have gone into someone's room to sleep, and everyone says, oh, please, give me a break. Who does that? These are central nervous system depressants. Your body is exhausted by the time you get to some of these higher blood alcohol content levels. Um, so it's really not, you know, it's it's not surprising at all. 
Um, in some of the later stages, um, confusion, you're going to pass out. Um, you might not even feel pain as readily as a sober person as the, as the, um, the more interior parts of your brain are affected. Um, you might vomit. That happens a lot. <laughs> Um, some people will actually go into comas um, due to the um, excess consumption of alcohol. And the very last things to go, right, are the things that we have in common with lizards, right, that, that the brain stem part of our brain down where our necks um, reach our, our heads. Um, it, it has the ability to maintain a heart rate and breathe. So. Um, once you've, you know, once that is depressed by alcohol, people die of alcohol poisoning. Um, it, 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 on average, your BAC is 0.50 or greater. You're probably not going to live. Some people die at, at alcohol concentrations less than that. Some people die at um, alcohol concentrations greater than that. The only remedy, there is not one magic pill you can give that is going to like rid your body of alcohol. The only remedy, if you have someone that is on the verge of dying of alcohol poisoning, is to put them on a respirator and let the liver clear the body of the alcohol, right? Because I said before, your liver in the passage of time is what makes people um, sober again. That's why it's really heartbreaking when you hear about these cases, like in, in frat, in hazing cases, you know, where people are kind of left to die. Um, but also what often happens is people are left on their back and they vomit and then they aspirate. But, um, but many people do simply die because of excess consumption of alcohol. And if you don't believe me, there is a, um, a contemporary example. All right, I would like to um, talk briefly about blackouts versus passouts. Um, so blackouts, um, are periods of memory loss. And let me just say, I'm not going to be able to give you some magic way of um, rewriting science. Blackouts are a simple fact of life. Um, uh, they're a simple fact of, of, um, of toxicology of alcohol life, not a simple fact of every aspect of life. But if you are dealing with a victim that was consuming a lot of alcohol, um, you know, it's non-conceivable that she may have blacked out. Now, the easiest way to find this out is, do you have a cohesive narrative? You know, do, do, uh, does, she, does she say that there are periods of time that um, she cannot remember? Um, it, a blackout is um, not a loss of consciousness. Um, it's your, your brain's ability to form, like, a long-term memory from a short-term memory has been um, eliminated by the effect of um, alcohol on a little part of your brain called the hippocampus. It doesn't really matter. But the one thing I want to say is if you're dealing with a victim who does remember waking up saying no, you know, alcohol is not a hallucinogen. Now, I'm not going to, we're not, we don't have time to like talk about marijuana and everything else, <laughs> you know, that, that it introduces another aspect. But if you're dealing with a case that is simply an alcohol case and you have a victim that remembers telling you, I said no, or I told him get off me, or I, you know, I tried to push him off me and I couldn't, then your choice, you have two choices. It either happened or your victim is lying to you. And I would suggest that we don't usually go into any other crime assuming that the victim is lying. Because alcohol does not cause people to hallucinate. And your jurors, if, if they've been drunk before, will know that, right? And so will, if you've been drunk before, you'll know it too. Unfortunately, in many cases, the things that you remember really did happen. So if you're dealing with somebody who has a, a, a memory, um, it's really important to point out to the jury that, you know, based on their own experiences, like alcohol does not cause people to hallucinate. So, so what, what normally do you hear about the, the kind of blackout defense? The blackout defense is usually going to be um, something, well, let, let me back up a second. All right. 
Um, blackouts are not just related to blood alcohol content. If you, you know, they, they do come at the higher blood alcohol content levels, but you're more likely to have a blackout if your blood alcohol content rises rapidly. So if you're drinking shots on an empty stomach and your blood alcohol content skyrockets up, you're more likely to have a blackout than um, when you kind of drink slowly over this um, course of, uh, over a period of time. Um, but the one important thing is blackouts occur later in the scheme of things and will almost always be accompanied by gross manifestations of intoxication. So if you're dealing with someone that really is blacking out, there's going to be a lot of signals to an average person that this is someone who may not be <laughs> wanting to consent to voluntary intoxication. Right? Often they will have thrown up, they will be slurring their words, they will be stumbling. Now, <laughs> I would say always, except there's always some like weird group that posts something online saying like, you know, we found this case where this person looks totally actually blacked out. It, it, it's, it's, it's almost ridiculous, to, to, but I'm not going to get into it because we're running short of time. They're almost always accompanied by um, signs of gross intoxication. Uh, let me just, one, oh, one uh, one last, so, so it's important to say about the blackout defense, which is, you know, she doesn't remember that one period of time when she, you know, said that she wanted me, right? Well, you're right, she doesn't remember that. She does remember saying no. You know, there, there might not even be actual evidence that a, um, that a blackout actually occurred. Um, and the defendant would pretty much have to take the stand to, to say that. Um, but, again, I mean, there's no magic bullet. Um, but if you have a defendant that you're, you're um, sort of uh, interviewing and they say, you know, she said yes, try to get them to – it's a double-edged sword for them. They love to talk about how the victim was so drunk and you can't trust anything they say. So try to get them to explain that part of it. And, and what's going to come out is that this is a person who should have known um, that the person was not consenting. Blackouts are not passouts. Um, pass outs, you, you're, you're, you're rendered unconscious by the use of alcohol. Many rapes occur while people are passed out. Um, it, remember, alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. Um, it can last for many hours, um, and that groggy feeling can last, you know, can ruin an entire day after. So I'm going to talk real quickly about drugs um, used to facilitate sex assault as opposed to alcohol, which is the most common drug used. Um, to facilitate uh, sex assault. It's, they're similar in action, they're central nervous system depressants, so they have a similar effect on the body, and they act um, more quickly, like they, there's a bigger bang for your buck than alcohol, right? So if I'm a, I am a beer drinker, so it takes me a while because I have to keep drinking those beers for my blood alcohol to rise. So um, whereas if I give, you know, if somebody gives a pill that's very potent, it occurs very quickly. There's also a synergistic effect with um, when you um, combine it with alcohol. It's like two depressants, you add them together, and, and the, re the result is like one plus one equals three. Um, the one thing um, that I wanted to say is they, they can cause amnesia. It's not, you know, I, the hangover movie is really funny, but I think people have this mistaken idea that you could be given a date rape drug and then, like, raise hell all over Vegas. They would have been, you know, passed out and would never have awakened, right? They wouldn't have been able to raise that um, hell throughout Vegas. Um, so you might consider a lot of victims think, you know, I was, I was drugged. Um, and, you, and sometimes it's just that they drank so much alcohol. But you might want to consider that somebody's been drugged if they have a disproportionate response um, to the amount of alcohol that they actually drank. Now, keep in mind that these drugs are always going to be given to a victim who is already drinking alcohol. In other words, if I'm at Dunkin' Donuts drinking coffee and someone comes in and gives me a roofie or a GHB, and then some knight in shining armor says, here, let me escort her home. She's something. People are going to remember that, and it's going to be weird. So that's not the way that people administer day rape drugs. It's done at a bar when you have someone that is already drinking, and it's, you know, oh, look at that person can't hold her alcohol, and isn't that other person nice? 
to accompany um, him or her home. Um, so there are classes of drugs. Um, GHB and rohypnol were kind of like the common classic historical drugs, and I'm not suggesting that they're not still used, but the drugs in your or your parents or your loved ones or your friends' um, medicine cabinet are becoming drugs of choice. So we had a local case, a, uh, a Ambien, you know, and it was a local police officer um, was drugging victims with by putting Ambien in their drinks. Um, that's a classic, you know, one central nervous system depressant that puts you to sleep plus alcohol, and you're going to get that incredibly potent effect. So um, kind of know when they are indicated if, you know, you, you have this huge disproportionate effect. Don't assume that, um, that no confirmed drug means no prosecution. Usually by the time a person realizes they may have been drugged, makes it to the emergency room, because remember, they're going to be out of it. They're not going to be like the hangover movie, Little Detectives, the next day. You're going to feel like a sledgehammer hit you. Um, by the time they get to the emergency room, it's just not, um, it's, it's, probably going to be too late. These drugs tend to be rapidly metabolized. Uh, hair, like some places, some private labs are starting to test hair. Ten years ago I thought like maybe hair would be the way of the future, but it's just, it's really like, uh, it's, it's hard to, um, it's kind of like you're looking, you're searching for an unknown, you know, not a lot of public labs do it. It's very, very expensive. Um, so I, don't, I'm, I finish one minute late, and I'll, I'll answer the last question in a second. But I just so hopefully some of this stuff, you know, um, and and there are other classes that can really talk about sort of using some of these principles when you're trying an alcohol facilitated sex assault case. But hopefully you will really kind of think about toxicology when you start to analyze um, these cases and make charges, charging decisions going forward and sort of recognize that offenders use alcohol and drugs as weapons the same way that, you know, other people use a gun to rob a liquor store. You, you can use other, you can use, you can rob a liquor store without a gun, <laughs> but it's a lot easier <laughs> if you use a weapon, right? And that's the exact same thing about um, drugs. So the one person asked, does the body process alcohol at a faster rate when doing strenuous physical activity? I don't really, so some of these questions I will say, it's hard to design studies that would study that, but I tend to, to think not. So originally I would think like, well, your, your, your pulse is increasing, so it's going through your liver faster, but you only have a set amount of enzymes. So I don't think that that has ever been, I, I don't know, I've, I've never looked at that. So. I apologize. I get these questions and I feel terrible that I can't answer them, but I don't know if it's ever been studied. I will definitely look, but sort of my gut response is to say no. In terms of experts, this is not, I, I, I appreciate like that, um, that the comment about being very powerful, and I really do appreciate it, but it's not complex science. You could literally, you know, I have, science degrees from undergraduate and I have a toxicology degree, but you could Google this and you would see all of it. Like, if you have a toxicologist in your um, jurisdiction that, um, you know, that has a degree in toxicology, whoever's been analyzing your um, stuff, you might want to use them that way. I will say this, um, I, I, I don't necessarily know that it's always going to be beneficial to call a toxicologist. I think the more power, there are certain cases, like I, I thought, I told you in my previous case, if it hadn't pled out, I was going to call a toxicologist to talk about the fact that startling events don't sober people, um, but the case pled. That would be an example of when it's really appropriate to use a toxicologist. Um, or if you have like a defined um, sort of question that would really lend itself to kind of having someone talk about this. Um, so, um, but, but 
in general, you're sort of like, I think today I probably spent a lot of time telling you things that you knew that you didn't know you knew. And what I'm hoping is that you can do the same thing with your jury. Mm -hmm. Tell them things that you they didn't know they knew. So I, I also want to indicate, and I'm going to hand it back to Aquatas now because I just went over, and I apologize. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry. Did Aquatas <laughs> has a lot of resources. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was great, Jen. Um, so um, thanks for all of that. That's really helpful. And I know people can reach out to you if they have questions because even if you – you're not going to call a toxicologist to testify in a case, it might be really helpful to consult with uh, one, either from your state lab or uh, regional lab should have a toxicologist. Or um, you, I know I'm glad you brought up the distinction. You're not a toxicologist, but you do have that degree. But you would be willing to talk to people as well about issues. Oh, right? I, I talk to people all day. I have no problem discussing cases with people. That's and, totally um, no problem at all. I will advance to that last <laughs> slide that has your contact information on it. So, <laughs> Jen oh, Summers boy. is one of Equitas' resources. So, <laughs> uh, the, uh, so th I think um, that can be very helpful. And um, you can always reach out to us here at Equitas um, that we can either connect you with uh, folks. There's um, a, uh, other nationally known uh, toxicologists that we work with um, that also would be uh, super helpful when you have these questions. We're happy to hook you up with uh, some of those folks. Um, but th this was great because it really does make this reachable for the average prosecutor and, and helps us understand it. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, uh, John and Jen, for your presentation. Thanks to everyone who's been on the call. And just a reminder, this is John's contact information. Our website is there. And like he said, we're happy to help connect you to the resources that you need to do the work that you do in your community. So thanks again for your participation today. Uh, like we said, we're recording it. We'll send out that recording link when it's available. And just remember that Equitas is here 24-7 to provide technical assistance and training related to prosecution and violence against women. Have a good day.